Welcome to a course on operating system security boundaries. We'll delve into the issue of using Windows systems for illustration, as they're the most popular operating systems in use. Since Windows is so popular with users, we'll spend most of our working hours on protecting this system. Microsoft has a well-defined security policy that we'll also use as an example to highlight some theoretical aspects. Trustworthy computing forms a part of Microsoft's security policy. The initiative was launched in 2002, and its goal is to ensure the security, confidentiality, and reliability of data processing. It has also defined the concept of a Windows security boundary. This term relates to protecting users by sandboxing some areas, by separating some operations that are potentially unsafe. They have to be isolated so they don't run in an uncontrolled manner and affect other components of the system environment and other users. The simplest boundary might look like the picture below. A boundary uses rules to separate code and data from other code and other data. If it's defined in this way, a boundary specifies that a code that is launched on one side of the boundary shouldn't access the code and data of the other side or that the access has to be controlled by an explicitly defined rule. The rules have to be intuitive enough so that the user can grasp and follow them. This means that an OS developer, in this case Microsoft, has to maintain the defined boundary. The developer has to react to all violations of the boundary and all attempts to cross it. If a security boundary is to isolate some processes, it has to be worth the time and money it will cost to maintain it. The rules used for a boundary have to be set explicitly. It can't be a state border or the sort of border that you only need to slow down to cross through. It should be more like the border between North and South Korea. High fences, barbed wire, and a minefield in between. The boundary has to be strong enough to make unauthorized passage impossible, or at least significantly hinder it. If we assume it as such, it turns out that maintaining security boundaries could incur too great a price, not only for a system developer, but above all for users. If you had a chance to work with Windows Vista, you could witness this in practice. The system enforced a strict boundary between administrator and user account roles. An example of this was Windows pop-ups that repeatedly asked whether you really wanted to execute an operation. Microsoft has learned their lesson and new versions of the system are less bothersome. Although, as we'll see soon, the boundary still exists. The more boundaries a system implements, the less user-friendly it becomes. You can't put too much weight on security by reducing functionality. A violation of a security boundary has to be met with a prompt reaction from the software developer, or otherwise boundaries wouldn't perform their function. One peculiar thing about cybercrime is that developing an attack technique requires specialized knowledge, commitment, and also money but a subsequent use of a pre-made scenario is much easier. After a given vector becomes automated, it's a walk in the park. Any boundary crossing has to entail an immediate reaction from software developers. A consequence of the outlined assumptions is the fact that operating systems, including Windows, implement a lot fewer security boundaries than it would seem. It's worth noting that there's much fewer boundaries than the marketing materials that sing the praises of ASLR, DEP, and other security solutions would have you believe. As it will turn out, these solutions don't necessarily define any security boundaries.